to be honest, I'm even more excited than you are. <laughs> Uh, because I was, I was in touch with Mark just the, the last few days and I said, oh my God, I'm, I'm having a couple of speeches and, uh, and panel discussions and stuff on ITB and that's all my home turf. So I feel really secure. I know all the other people. I know half of the audience. But this is something really new and exciting. And uh, when it all came up, I read through that there are a lot of big topics. There are a lot of important guys sitting around here in the industry, uh, in, the, in, in the audience. And I just thought like, okay, what can I bring to the table with all of this high caliber of you coming with all of your experience? And I thought I might give you a different angle on some uh, aspects of sustainable tourism. And in order to make it sound a little bit interesting, I said managing competitive environments, because a lot of the things we do has to do with um, not coming somewhere where there is so much demand that everybody's waiting for you. You have to kind of fight against other people. Um, or other companies in a, in a fair way, but uh, it, is a, it is a little war. And I was like, why computer games are actually better than business schools? And uh, I know it's a bit provocative, but it has to do also with where I'm coming from, because I had, or I'm, I'm still attending studies. Uh, every time I finish a study, I start a new one. I'm a bit of an education junkie. And I, I used to manage a business school um, as, uh, for, for 11 months until I realized um, I'm too young for that. I was the youngest dean in Switzerland of a private MBA school. Um, we had really super professors, it was very interesting, but the whole environment was moving so slow that I felt like, oh my God, um, I was 32, I said, I can't do that anymore. And I go back to what I actually did, because there's only one good th uh, thing that I'm, I think I'm, I'm not too bad in. Um, I love founding companies, and not like the big style, going for venture capital, and this like very practical, hands-on. And what I like today uh, to do today is to share with you a little bit um, the excitement about starting companies, to explain to you why I believe, I firmly believe, that sustainable development of any country has to do with enabling young people to start their own enterprise. And the second thing also, uh, a little bit, uh, going back to the topic why computer games are better than business schools, to take like what can you learn from computer games and really the old school shit. And, oh, sorry, you're not, <laughs> I'm not supposed to use the, the S word or the F word up here. I apologize for that. It's my, it's my German mentality. I'm from the south of Germany. We are like, um, like the Mediterraneans, very <laughs> enthusiastic people. We've got a coastline. It's Sweetwater. It's only the Lake of Constance, but it's a coastline. So <laughs> at least that. And I like to start with this one, because that was my first business. And um, I was 14. So in Germany, it's illegal to start your business when you're 14. You're not allowed legally to sign any contract. So the only thing how this works, maybe first of all, why did I start it? It was quite easy. On the left side, this exciting green bike is a Kettler aluminum bike. And when I was 14, that was the German mountain bike. Boring. Very stable, very good quality, like everything in Germany, but very boring. And on the other side, this is a specialized uh, rock hopper or stump jumper. Uh, this was the kind of mountain bike I wanted to get, but that was coming from the States and it was far beyond my budget. So I was 14 and my dad was not giving me enough money to buy a US mountain bike. He said, you can have the German one. And I said, the German one is boring. So I tried to, how can I get it? And my grandpa has told me like that there's always like a manufacturer, then there's an assembler, then there's an, uh, some kind of distribution chain where somebody's importing things, and everybody gets a share and get, gets a margin. So I just took my budget and went back the mountain bike value chain until I found the step to go in where my budget was enough for an American style mountain bike. And that was with the manufacturer of the frame in South Korea. So the question is, if you're a 14-year-old and you want to import an unbranded mountain bike frame from South Korea, it's not as easy as you might think. So I went to the office of my dad and I abused his computer, an old IBM, and I made myself a logo. I called it Weber Fahrrad Service with a little bike, the office address of my dad, and the fax number. And I'm a bit older than some of you. In those days, if you had a fax number, you were a company. And nobody questioned that, because no private person would use such an advanced technology like a fax machine. So um, I used the fax number of my dad, and I, I just sent in, I said, well, we're interested in, in kind of growing bigger, and I want to see uh, what we can import from your side. Uh, then they said, please send me your, um, your distributor and importer's price list. And they faxed it back, old days. And then I said, OK, um, before we, you have to understand, before we really go into mass import, we have to import one bike to see the quality. 
<laughs> and I imported this one bike and I, I got it and uh, I went to school. I was very proud with my new bike and some of my classmates were like, uh, look, your dad has a lot of money. This is why he got you this bike. That was always so unfair because my family is not rich and I got less, less pocket money than most of my colleagues because my dad said, you're 14 if you want to get some money, work for it. And um, so I said, no, it's unfair. I bought it for this and this price. And I said, no, it's impossible for that price. I said, yes. And then in the, well, the main break, somebody came and said, like, can you get me a bike as well? <laughs> and that's how the business started, because I said, well, yes. And I thought, I don't have to do that for free, because I was smart, and so I earned a lot of money. And I put a margin on top of it, 20 German mark, which is, I think, today 10 euros. And for this 10 euros, I was importing the mountain bike, which came in a big box. I was assembling it in the garage of my dad. <laughs> so I had to buy all the toolkits to assemble bikes. And I even was providing service for the first three months. How stupid is that with such a low margin? <laughs> but business took off. I imported about 20 mountain bikes. And unfortunately, it finished a year later because we had the Eurobike trade show, which is the biggest trade show for bikes. In, uh, and that was in my town in Germany. And my South Korean supplier sent me a trade show professional invitation, which I took. I took a tie from my dad, and I had jeans, and I printed business cards for five marks at the supermarket with a little bike on it, <laughs> because I thought, well, you had to have uh, 10 business cards with me. And I was trying to get on the fairground, which was difficult, because security said, this is no kindergarten. <laughs> but I showed an official invitation. I showed my passport, and they couldn't avoid having me there. Then I met my South Korean uh, supplier. He saw up my age, and the business was over. <laughs> <laughs> so it ended like this. So I had to do something else. And just to cut a long story short, I then started, I wanted to become a journalist. So I was writing for the school newspaper, because that's a good career start. They didn't print my articles, because I was critical with the regime, with uh, our head of school, and so on. And I was, uh, it was more an investigative journalism that I did. And they didn't print it, because uh, the, the censorship, the teacher that was supervising the school newspaper said, no way. Um, and I thought, we are in a country with press freedom. This is very important. So uh, I started publishing an own newspaper with four friends. We started printing it. And instead of charging for it, we charged for advertising and gave it to everyone for free, free of charge. Since nobody did control us, we were really doing investigative journalism, like the important topics like, um, oh, the headmaster has a bottle of cognac in his cupboard. And we know that the, uh, that the geography teacher is smoking secretly every break in the room where we store all of the cards and stuff like that with pictures. And uh, so everybody liked it, and it, it really became very popular. It was partly legal, um, because we told everybody that if they do not advertise in our newspaper, we will investigate and find out something bad about their business. <laughs> <laughs> so we blackmailed them into advertising clients. Um, and, and then we got the, one of the first 10 computers outside universities in Germany. And we had a little um, group of people, and we were programming very basic HTML. It was before TCP IP. Um, Web.de was a telephone book with IP numbers. So you said, like, oh, books? And then you read in a printed book, Amazon, an IP number. And you typed that IP number in, and it took, like, 20 minutes. And then you got an Amazon page with text only, and you could order books. And wow, surprise, the next morning it was at your local bookstore to pick, ready to pick up or delivered at home. Fantastic. So we started producing websites. Um, I did a little business with distributing low-cost um, uh, laptops to students because I was fed up that quality laptops were so expensive at my uh, university. And everybody told me there is no, not enough margin to make them cheaper. So I just cut out again the rest of the value chain. I imported them directly from the manufacturer and gave it to the students with no margin at all, but with a subscription. I was a bit more clever than with the bike business then. A, subscri a subscription of 10 Swiss francs per month. And for that 10 Swiss francs per month, if you had any kind of problem with your computer, which you frequently had those days, every Friday we had two IT professionals coming there. And like with a doctor, you could sit in a waiting room and then come with your laptop, and they were curing the thing. <laughs> so um, that was really successful. But then I left the country to do something else. And we came back in 2010. I founded Swiss Hospitality Solutions. That's the company that's actually paying for my living today. We're a small consulting company. with um, We just employed uh, employee number seven from the consultants and a little back office. So it's, it's really small. Um, LWP is a little. Is another company because I have so many ideas that I can't do with the, they have nothing to do with the core business in the consulting company, so I'd rather have them aside to see whether they're losing money or not. 
Uh, and uh, the latest investment was just a month ago, Top Alliance is a limousine service, uh, which you can see at ITB, a limousine is a growing market. And um, the most people running limousine companies are stupid or very big. And in the middle field, there is a lot of opportunities. So the big question, what you ask yourself, like, why am I so stupid to found all of these businesses? What went wrong? And actually, I, I started very thoroughly, and I had a very clear idea about what I want to do when I'm grown up. And it was, the, it was the usual things, but then something happened. I got my first computer, don't laugh. <laughs> Commodore C64, you could connect it to the television screen. And it was, it was a nightmare, but it was exciting. And I came across this beautiful game that some of you might still know. Pac-Man, huh? <laughs> and the interesting thing is, Pac-Man, I think today, told me more than the four or five studies I have done. Um, I've been to some of the best business schools in my field, tourism and hospitality. I've been to international business schools. I, as a dean, I had the chance to work with Harvard professors, Yale professors, professors from China, from Russia. It was really exciting. But one thing was lacking, the things you learn when you play Pac-Man. And this is what I want to share with you, because Pac-Man has very simple rules. Either you make it to the next level, or you get out of business. And if you apply Pac-Man to any kind of business, it's so easy. For instance, hospitality. Level 2015, we've got the hotelier, and everybody in this trade show is talking about two things. We've got increase in costs, and we've got stagnating revenues. So if your cost increase and your revenue stagnates, your margin is being eaten up, or you go bankrupt, or something like this, and everybody's concerned. So once you, you understand that with the Pac-Man logic, you can also solve it in a Pac-Man logic, meaning easy and fast. So this is why I'm stating computer games are better than business schools, in brackets, to teach you entrepreneurial skills that you need for the jungle out there. Business schools, don't get me wrong, are not bad. Business schools are good. Education is one of the greatest things that our generation and your gen well, I say our generation, that <laughs> makes me feel young, that our generation has. Having access to all of this fantastic material, and it's enough if you have internet access, you can download and stream the best professors, the greatest minds on earth, live and free of charge. That is brilliant. That was never there before. Uh, even if you could go to a library and, and, and kind of borrow a book for a couple of weeks, it was not the same like going on iTunes University or YouTube and just having a look at the speech of Michael Porter or any of these brilliant guys. However, in business schools, it's too bureaucratic. They do not teach you about entrepreneurship. They do not excite you. Although even Harvard Business School has an entrepreneur program, an incubator, and so on and so forth. But it's great programs. They're doing their best what they can. But the problem with business schools is they're too much into theory and mindset, and you have to think it through, and you have to have a business plan, and, and a vision, and a mission, and a strategy. If you really are an entrepreneur on a small scale, you don't have time for a business plan, for a vision statement, for a mission. You don't need that. You need clients. You need revenues. You need to provide something which gives value to your clients. Don't write it into a business plan. We just write this shit for the banker. Sorry, again. We, we just write business plans to get money from somewhere or to look more important, but usually just to get money from somebody who has no idea about our business. They just know business plans. So it has to look the standard format. It does not tell nothing about the story. The different story on the other side with all the venture capital uh, we have in, like here or in London, they just want the story without any kind of uh, business plan behind it because they say, oh, if one out of 10 makes it, I get my money back. I think that's poor. One out of 10, that's a 10% success ratio. We don't have, it's my own company, uh, money in all of these companies. I can't afford to lose nine times before I win once. I'd rather make sure that I earn money with all of them right from the start, and it is possible. So why this excitement about entrepreneurship? If we talk about sustainable tourism, think of the man with the ice shop. Sustainable tourism, usually, in my point of view, and that's a personal point of view, it's uh, not a big study or something, it's just my personal point of view, is built on small enterprises. It's built on guys like this ice cream sa uh, salesperson, who has his little shop, who's standing there, who has supply, demand, who has to buy the ice cream, who has to deliver the ice cream, who has to look into the cashier that he has enough money at the end of the day. These are the guys that really do something in the market because 
I think we all agree that it's not built on a few big players. We've got enough of these guys just putting these ugly hotels with a lot of rooms. Uh, some of them are our clients, so I avoid the brands. But <laughs> if we build a hotel, usually you get um, a certain building and you try to fit as much rooms as possible into there because the more rooms you have, the more guests you can accommodate, the more guests you have, the more revenue you make. So we build standardized cooking, cutting, boring products and we then, then we fly in mass tourism and we bring a lot of these people. And the problem with this is it's not sustainable at all because all the profits from these companies go back into other countries. And I think that's wrong. I think this is one of the biggest problems that we have. I'm, I'm lecturing at a couple of hotel schools and universities and we all have projects. The latest one I was a bit involved and I backed out was in Myanmar. Is anybody from Myanmar? Okay, beautiful country. But I went, I, I stepped out of the project when I realized that actually we were not building up a hotel school to educate them how to do their own business. We were building up a mass delivery of cheap labor. We were teaching them as waiters, as chefs, as housekeepers, but not in management. We did not teach them how do you do your own hotel? How do you start with a little bed and breakfast? How do you become the next Conrad Hilton? We should teach them like this is the Swiss way of setting a table. And we were doing this for one reason, because these guys with the big hotels want to make profit, so they want to have a, a large labor. Why do they go to these countries? Low labor cost. They don't build these kind of hotels in Switzerland anymore because we've got a high labor cost. Or Norwegian, uh, uh, Norway has very high labor cost. In these countries, cheap labor force. So they go in there and say, oh, we get a lot of cheap waitresses and, uh, and housekeepers and so on. And then we market it to countries with a certain buying power it has a, a duration of maybe 10, maybe 20 years. And if we get enough people in, we get the real estate money back out. And if it lasts a bit longer, it's fine. We make a lot of profit. But nobody has an interest in kind of bringing the region up. Nobody's interested in, the soon, as soon as they do not earn money anymore, as soon as it becomes kind of shaky, they pull out. We can see that, for instance, in North Africa, we can see that Egypt is a super example. If you look into Sharm El Sheikh, into Urgada, into any of these cities, the minute it got difficult, because people thought it's not safe to be there, all the big brands, all the logos disappeared from the buildings. If you, come, if you would have traveled to Sharm El Sheikh like 10 years back and you see the Mervenpeg and the Accors and the Hiltons and the Marriott's everywhere, if you travel today, you just see unbranded hotels. Why? Because these guys, they just move on. And this is why I think, oh, sorry, wrong slide. Sustainable tourism development requires entrepreneurship and requires bringing in that spirit that people start their own businesses, that it's not a Marriott, that it's Mr. Miller's bed and breakfast. And today's technology allows everyone to even take your bedroom, your couch, and to market it to a global audience on Airbnb. It's easy. You can do that. It's much easier than before. Before, you always had to go through people who controlled that. The biggest problem we have is that some of the big companies are controlling the flight capacity to bring people to these destinations. So if you're toy and you control all the charter flights into a certain destination, you control demand, and you dictate everybody how much you're gonna pay per night or for a full or all-inclusive or whatever. So this is a different uh, project, and we're, um, I'm involved into a little, little project in Urgada where some of the local hotel uh, owners try to get independent from the airline capacity by building up their own kind of supply chain. Really interesting. But actually, if you start from scratch, if you start new, what we should actually do in Myanmar, for instance, is we should educate people how to start their own business, how to start with a, be with a, with a spare bedroom where as your sister or your brother moved out of your, uh, of your parents' home, and you just start marketing that in a nice way to tourists who really want to travel the country, who want to see the culture. We don't see the culture if you're on the pool with 500 other German or Russian tourists. You don't get anything from the country. In an all-inclusive resort, you don't even leave the resort. That's bad. In a bed and breakfast, you get your local breakfast and you ask your host, like, what should I do today? And they have full of expertise. Okay, so how do we enable entrepreneurship? Looking at the time, stop teaching, start playing. Start playing. Because what can we learn from computer games? A lot of great things. And apologize my age, you will see with the graphics, it's old computer games. It's not the super sophisticated Hollywood stuff we get today, because to be honest, they are too complex. I'm not smart enough for these kind of games. And, but this was, for instance, Civilization. 
in the number one, Sid Meier's civilization, you had to build countries, you had to invest in education and development. It was very simple rules, but actually you were building, you were building your own country and you had to take decisions uh, like, uh, like in a real country, like do I invest in a, in a larger army, do I just conquer my neighbor, or do I invest into education and science? So I'm, I'm smarter than my neighbor, I get more resources, and then I have more money, and I built the big army later on and conquer them, or something like that. Civilization was take a risk. If you don't know where you're going to, you have to build ships, and you have to go there, you have to explore it, and it's a risk whether you lose the ship or not. And risk taking is something which is good. Business schools do not teach you that. In a business school, if you take a risk, it's bad. For instance, if you answer out of the box, and it's very creative, but it's not in line with the electronic test format that your business school supplies, you get zero points. If you take the risk of cheating in class, and the teacher calls you, even if you did a very smart cheat, uh, like a high-tech thing in your ear, or some kind of smartphone application, or um, I'm waiting for the first students to use Google Glasses to cheat in tests, <laughs> things like that, I think this is very smart and you should do it, but business schools will blame you for that. They kick you out. Swiss Hotel School, Lucerne, very renowned, very traditional. You have to come with a tie and everything. Um, we got one guy. He hacked the, uh, the school server to get the exams. And we kicked him out of the school immediately. And I called him secretly. I didn't tell my colleagues and said, you know what? That wasn't clever. Uh, I mean, the not clever part was getting caught. But what you did was actually very clever. We're in touch with a lot of technology companies and tourism, like reservation systems and so on. If you want to, I'll pass on your resume because there you can use your computer skills. <laughs> because actually the guy is talented, huh? just not for the business school way. Another one, you know this one, Tetris, huh? What happens in Tetris if you don't decide where to put the brick? It builds up and you're game over. So here you have to keep moving, you have to be fast. Business schools are like big companies. We have meetings about innovation. And then we say, oh yeah, we gotta do this, it's a hot topic. And then it takes about one to two years until the hot topic finds its way into the curriculum. It's too old, exactly. By the time the topic is part of the curriculum, it's already outdated. Uh, like ITB right here, I came this morning from a breakfast session, we have a European advisory board, because in my field, revenue management, we created a European certification which gets reviewed constantly. It's all online, it's all electronic so that we can change it because if you've got classic textbooks, I mean, try to change chapter five. It's, it's difficult, it's hard. Huh? If you do that on, on, uh, online in an e-learning system or in a YouTube video or something, easy, just do it. Every level gets more difficult and every year it's getting harder out there because the whole market situation, it does not only get more complex, but we got more transparency and it gets faster. We see that speed is increasing year by year by year and the reason for this is the, you all know the, 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 Moore's, um, the Moore's law about computer chips getting more uh, powerful every generation and this is putting a lot of pressure and speed on the market. But it's not good, like many of my colleagues, I was yesterday with the alumni of the Cornell University and uh, the Lausanne Hotel School in the Adlon and then there were these old general managers, 67 years, 75, and some probably 100 plus. And they were like, yeah, you know, the good old times, blah, blah, blah. You have to embrace that it's getting tougher because that's a big chance for young entrepreneurs. If it gets tougher, these old guys get out of business because they can't handle it anymore. And you can get in because you started already on a higher level. You started with the technology. You started with the internet. My dad, he had to learn it. He had his first computer when he was 40. I mean, ah, useless. Executive education, especially MBA programs, are usually in, uh, deployed into blocks. You've got HR, you've got marketing, and so on. So not only that it's completely wrong that you teach HR and then you teach marketing and these kind of things, it's also that all of these blocks have the same level of difficulty. It doesn't get more difficult, so you're not used to it. Try to get extra points, because that gets rewarded in supermarkets. In schools, they grade the average. If you're great, they probably break you. Celebrate your success. I admit, students are good in doing that. <laughs> Cooperate when needed. But in most of the universities, if I ask the students, do you want to do it as a group work or on yourself? The good and smart students say, I'd rather do it on my own because I'm faster than the group of idiots. 
the reality is you will have to work with a lot of idiots later on, so it's good to do the group work, but maybe we're overdoing that a bit. And last not least, never give up. And I love this one. Thank you, Mario, but your princess in, is in another castle after you did the final level. <laughs> <laughs> so just to summarize that, entrepreneurship is the backbone of sustainable tourism. So if you want to build sustainability, start with embracing and enabling young people to start their own business. While they are at school, while they are at university, make them use whatever is there on the market free of charge in order to generate revenues while they're still learning. Because if you combine the practical experience of running a small business with what you actually teach in those schools, that's a very powerful combination. If you're just out there doing your business, you will end up like the ice cream guy. You never move on. But if you combine it with education, it's super powerful. So for this, thank you very much for your time. And I hope you didn't get bored. <laughs> <laughs>